Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Molar chamfer preparation. Sample unit from preclinical crown and bridge. With Dr. Robert E. Laurie, Professor of Dentistry, Department of Crown and Bridge, University of Michigan School of Dentistry. I have three purposes in this presentation. One is to show the components of the first of 17 multimedia instructional packages, which comprise the crown and bridge portion of sophomore preclinical dentistry at the University of Michigan. The second is to describe the process by which a course originally designed for the traditional lecture laboratory class of well over 100 students has been modified for individualized instruction. The third is to report how a course will be changed next year on the basis of information obtained by observing students and seeking their recommendations. During the academic year 1971-1972, Crown and Bridge Preclinical Dentistry was presented as a lecture laboratory course to 135 sophomore dental students. The course consisted of videotapes of the fabrication of posterior and anterior bridges and 17 instructional units. Each unit included a graphically illustrated procedural manual, a short quiz testing students' knowledge of the procedure, a short lecture, a videotape showing instructor carrying out the procedure, and step-by-step -step models and finished product acrylic models. For each unit, all students read the manual, took the quiz, and listened to the lecture and watched videotapes in the lecture hall. They then proceeded to the laboratory where models were available and instructors provided guidance and evaluated preparations. The instructional objective for the first unit was that the student will cut a molar chamfer preparation on a melamine tooth mounted in a visodont typodont. The preparation must meet all criteria as defined by a rating scale. These criteria are sharpness of margin, width of cervical chamfer, definition of the cervical chamfer, the amount of taper, length of proximal walls, and the amount of clusal reduction. One problem encountered highlights a need for individualized instruction. Since students differ in skill and speed, some had completed one project and were ready to begin the next before formal presentation had been presented in the lecture hall. Others who were still engaged in completing one project were asked to learn new material that they would not immediately utilize in the laboratory. We decided to adapt the existing course for individualized instruction, not only because we were committed to individualized curriculum, but also for two other reasons. First, our own experience had shown how a lockstep course slows the progress of the most able students and presents the slower students with instruction before they have time to act on it. Second, existing materials offered a good beginning for individualized instruction. For convenience, we decided to select for the pilot project students who had been assigned to the bench at one end of the lab. Any student who preferred not to participate would have the option of remaining in the regular class. Bench positions had been assigned alphabetically for the entire preclinical course. The nine students assigned to the first bench were asked to attend an orientation meeting. We told them the purpose of the project and what they could expect in this experimental program. They would not attend lectures. They would proceed through the course at their own rate and would take each quiz at any time they wished prior to viewing a video videotape. Instructional associates would observe them in the lab record their interactions with their instructor, and photograph their preparations. They would be asked to provide information through questionnaires or interviews that would help us improve the course. All information would be used solely for course development and would have no effect on their grades. Although the choice to participate or to remain with the regular course was entirely theirs, all elected the pilot project. I would like to show now the materials and their method of delivery and how they were adapted to individualized instruction. We will observe students throughout their completion of the first instructional unit 
the molar preclinical chamfer preparation. At the same time, I will comment briefly on the methods used to gain information and how that will be used to improve the course for next year. For each unit, the student studied the graphically illustrated procedural manual. He then took a short quiz. Since students took these quizzes at different times, it was necessary to provide them individually with knowledge of results. The commercially available answer sheet shown here is designed to give this immediate feedback. Answer sheets are constructed so that when the student erases over the selected alternative, one of the four letters is exposed. The test writer keys his exam so that one of the letters, in this case E, consistently informs the student that he is correct. Any of the other three letters tells him he has made an error. When the student makes an error, he tries again until he has selected the correct alternative. The answer sheet thus provides immediate knowledge of results to the students. They also provide a record of student performance to the instructor. After taking the quiz, the students watched the videotape on an easily operated Sony video cassette tape machine. Lining ourselves up back and forth to make sure we have the proper line of draw, and then we will prepare our first tracer cut. The Visidant melamine does not cut the same as enamel, but this will give you a, a good idea of how it's going to be in the mouth. After viewing the tape, students could view a slide tape program which showed several chamfer preparations made by students during the previous year and selected to demonstrate common errors. As each preparation appeared on the screen, students identified flaws. The same slides were shown again and the flaws identified on audio tape. The students then went into the lab to work on preparations. Step-by-step -step models and plaster models of final preparations were available. We noted that students differed widely in the use of materials in the lab itself. Some closely followed the manual throughout the preparation, some studied the models, and others did not. Thus, in the lab, when different options in choice of materials were possible, students varied in their choices. I will discuss individual differences in choice of different instructional materials later on in this tape. You may have noted already that in adapting other materials, the procedure manual and the videotape, for the pilot project, we preserve the uniformity in instructional materials and sequencing from the lecture laboratory course. Now the question is whether this was a sound decision. While students worked on their preparations and consulted faculty, it was possible to observe errors commonly made, questions frequently asked, and solutions proposed by instructors. To provide a record of a student's performance in the laboratory, two observers were present. The first recorded students' comments, instructors' comments to students, and student-faculty interactions. The second photographed student preparation showing common errors and excellent preparations. These records will show what problems students had in completing a particular preparation. They will also show the role the instructor played in laboratory teaching. Information concerning problems encountered will help us to modify existing instruction to improve performance. Data on the role of the instructor will help us to identify the essential role of the teacher and to develop materials in other media when they will suffice. The intention is not to replace the teacher, but rather to free him for instructional activities that require his unique capabilities. In this course, it was interesting that most questions concerned whether or not some part of the preparation was adequate, usually defined by size. For example, is this slice far enough to the buckle or is this deep enough? As the final step, the instructor evaluated the student's preparation, made recommendations for change if any were necessary, reevaluated until the preparation was satisfactory in the terms of the stated criteria. All students did complete molar chamfer preparations that met the criteria. 
At the end of the first term, in an anonymous questionnaire, all students reported that they would recommend the pilot project to a friend who was free to choose between the pilot project and the regular course. Incidentally, all students elected the pilot project for themselves for the second term. My final purpose in this presentation is to describe what we learned in our project this summer and how it will be reflected on what we will do next year. I have briefly described some of our sources of information, but I would now like to discuss the major changes that follow from our experience and to do document their source. First, instructional materials should be developed which effectively teach students to identify flaws, flaws in preparations before they make the preparations themselves. This conclusion is derived from several sources. As noted before, in the laboratory, students frequently asked instructors for judgments concerning size or dimensional aspects of a preparation. For example, are the grooves deep enough? Is this tapered enough? Or how far to the buckle should the slice go? Another point was when the entire class was asked if they believed that teaching students to identify flaws in preparations prior to working on them was a good idea, 85% said yes. When the student becomes a practicing dentist, he'll be required daily to evaluate and to modify his own performance as well as to evaluate products he receives from the dental laboratory. Secondly, instructional options available to students should be broadened. Individualized instruction should go beyond allowing different rates of progress for different students to include the choice of different methods of instruction. Research literature indicates that individuals differ in preferred methods of learning, and we should build on that knowledge. Additional input is provided from our experimental course. As noted earlier, in a lab when the use of models and consulting the procedural handouts was a student decision, students varied markedly in their approach and choice of method. Questionnaire data showed that most students would not have read the manual so closely had they not been concerned only with performing well in the lab and not additionally with scoring well on the quiz. Most students would have skipped portions of the videotapes had they been viewing them alone, and had they been indexed so that the student could select only the portions he wanted to see. They were in fact indexed in the second term, and students have been skipping portions. Some have chosen to skip whole tapes, yet all the students are meeting performance criteria. Thirdly, changes in evaluation methods and sequencing materials are indicated. This inference is based on several sources. First, students rated the quizzes rather low in testing points in the manuals most important for laboratory performance. The test given prior to the students working on a preparation should be specifically designed to test knowledge necessary for a good performance in the lab. The new tests will include items requiring students to evaluate preparations by the same criteria, which will be used to evaluate student products and items which are suggested by errors frequently made in the laboratory. Students will be required to demonstrate performance at the 90% level prior to beginning work on a preparation. The level required of established confidence is especially critical if students are to be allowed to choose among various instructional materials. Also, the emphasis on teaching students to evaluate quality of preparations and to evaluate students on how well they do so has provided the impetus to the faculty to demonstrate agreement among themselves in product evaluation. All members of the Cronin Bridge Department have evaluated the same student fabricated bridges to determine agreement among faculty and to plan methods to increase agreement. Although I have described and shown the components of one multimedia instructional unit, the emphasis has been far more on process rather than product. I have tried to show how existing materials may be modified for individualized instruction and how information gained through observing students, assessing performance, and asking students for recommendations for change may be used to improve instruction. Next year, these changes will be introduced. The following year, sophomore students in an individualized curriculum in dentistry will be taking a course that we hope will be much improved. The standards for evaluation are the same as they are for any instruction. Do students meet performance objectives? We are hoping, however, that the individualized program and the emphasis on validated instruction 
will permit many students to meet objectives more rapidly than they ever have in the past. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.